Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to welcome Joanna Zeiger with me today. Hello, Joanna. Welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, Joanna is the CEO at Canna Research Group. Do I have that correct? Canna Research Foundation. Canna Research Foundation. Thank you. Um, and I was introduced to Joanna just a few weeks ago. And after talking with Joanna and looking at her bio uh, as just, well, you, you have a, an incredible bio, both as an athlete, now as an author, and as a CEO, I just found what you've done extremely fascinating in your life so far. Um, and I just wanted to take some time today to learn more about you and what you're doing with the Canna Research Foundation. So again, thank you for being here. Sure, my pleasure. I always uh, enjoy giving information, uh, especially educating people about cannabis. Absolutely. So before we start talking about Canna Research Foundation, talk to me a little bit about your history as a triathlete, because as an amateur triathlete myself many years ago, I'm very, very um, impressed by you. Uh, but but just to give everybody a little bit of background, tell us what you've done and where you've come from in that realm, if you will. Sure thing. So um, I started off as a swimmer. I swam, I started swimming uh, competitively at the age of seven, swam through high school, uh, college, and uh, went to the Olympic trials and uh, swimming, um, qualified my senior year of high school. So the summer between my senior year of high school and college, I went to the first of uh, seven Olympic trials. So I've been an Olympic trials qualifier in three sports wow. and uh, swimming triathlon and marathon. Wow. And uh, I went to the Olympics in the sport of triathlon in 2000. Uh, it was in Sydney, I placed fourth. And I um, also was a world champion in the sport of triathlon at the 70.3 or half Ironman distance in 2008. Uh, I um, won numerous half Ironmans, um, a few Ironmans and multiple Olympic distance races. So in the sport of triathlon, you have uh, very short races called sprint distance. Those take for professionals an hour or less. The Olympic distance takes about two hours. A half Ironman takes about four to four fifteen. An Ironman, well, back when I was racing, it was slower. People are very fast now; they're way right. under nine hours. But for me, it was about nine nine or so hours. So I had a uh, very broad range as a as a triathlete. Um, loved the sport. Um, I had a career-ending bike accident in two thousand nine when I was defending my uh, world championship title. I broke my collarbone and I did severe um, structural and neuropathic damage to my rib cage that ails me to this day. And um, that's what brought me into the field of cannabis, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. Um, once my career in triathlon was over, I turned to running. I was a uh, sort of professional master's runner. Um, you know, I did win some prize money, but uh, wasn't at the level of people who are younger than me. I was over 40 at the time when I started running professionally uh, and qualified for the Olympic trials and the marathon uh, three times, uh, and then in triathlon three times and in swimming once. Amazing and quite impressive. Uh, I mean, to be an Olympic medalist. Uh, a no, it's fourth, fourth, fourth place. Is that not... Okay, on the fringe of being a medalist. On the fringe. On the I will say that the woman who won eventually got caught for doping a few years later, but um, didn't didn't uh, reallocate any medals. But uh, people were pretty certain at the time that she was doping. Uh, they just didn't have the testing at the time for uh, the the drugs that people the drug of choice at that time. Got it. Got it. Well, so you should have been handed the bronze medal at some point, I suppose. I don't know if my life would have changed any, but, uh, you know, such as it may. Such as it may, regardless, uh, some amazing accomplishments. And with that, uh, again, you, you've written a book now. You're, you're a professional coach, triathlete uh, for other triathletes and runners, correct? Yes. Yeah, so um, I have a PhD in epidemiology. So mm -hmm. I do uh, research and I uh, particularly cannabis research. And I also am a coach. I have been a coach for over 20 years. I work with endurance athletes. 
mainly triathletes and runners, but I have worked with climbers. I've worked with, um, do a lot of mental skills training. My book is called, uh, the champion mindset an athlete's guide to mental toughness. Um, do I have a copy of it around here? Um, no, but, I'll, um, I'll you can find it on Amazon. Yeah, and, I'll, I'll uh, so well. I, through my book, um, I actually, after that started doing a lot of mental skills coaching with, with athletes from all kinds of sports. And then as far as like training specific training plans, I work with runners, triathletes, and um, have worked with other sports as well. But that's sort of the main sports I work with. And I know you're based out of Boulder, Colorado, but do you work with athletes all over the country or all over the world? Or all over the world. I've actually worked with athletes all over the world. All over the world. So yeah. you can help athletes anywhere with training plans and programs wherever they are. Right, because the the platform I use is, um, you know, it's a web based platform and with uh, video chats. Um, I mean, back when I first started, I was using Excel spreadsheets. Things have come a long way since then. Sure. But now, you know, there's the wonderful online um, training platforms and you know video chats and so many ways to communicate with athletes that you don't have to physically be in the same place to really get somebody trained well. That's amazing and. Uh... Yes, living in Boulder, Colorado as well, I, I know how competitive the field is um, and, and how many people over the years have come to Boulder to train just because I think uh, the community is so strong and, and training at elevation uh, is so powerful. You could probably speak more to that than me as an amateur, but it just seems as though when I go out for a run or a bike ride, um, as, as competitive as I might be, I'm in the back of the pack always just in Boulder. It feels like, yeah, you know, when, when you in Boulder, I always like to joke, it doesn't matter what you do. There's always somebody who's doing it faster, further, better. Um, they're doing something crazier. They're doing some extreme thing. Um, you cannot be competing with other people in Boulder. You just have to set your own goals and stick to it because there's always somebody doing something that you're just blown away, blown away with. I mean, and right now we have a lot of uh, professional running groups here, professional triathletes come, you know, there's climbing, there's cycling. It's an outdoor playground here. So it's a, a natural place for people to come and train. Absolutely. Uh, with that being said, you alluded to, or you mentioned the fact that you had a, unfortunately a career ending accident, I think maybe in 2008, you said, um, and that's when you started to learn more about cannabis. Is that right? Or did you learn more at Johns Hopkins when you were studying there? So my degree is in genetic epidemiology. So I uh, looked at gene environment interactions and how they uh, impact birth defects. So I've come quite a, I've veered quite a bit away from uh, that. Okay. Um, when I moved to Boulder, uh, I worked at CU with the Institute for Behavioral Genetics. And um, while I was there, I worked a lot on um, substance use and conduct disorder in adolescents and young adults. I studied the three main drugs that I studied were tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana. And mm -hmm. I always like to say that when you're looking at the negative aspects of, of the drug, it's marijuana research. And when you're looking at it more agnostically, it's cannabis research. So back then I did marijuana research. Now I do cannabis research. Uh, but of course, you really don't want kids using cannabis. It's uh you know, multiple studies over the years, over the decades have shown that it can impact the growing brain in very negative ways. Um, but, you know, uh, depends on the cannabinoid that you're using. Cannabis is a very complicated plant and the plant itself is made up of many components. The two cannabinoids that are most famous are THC, which is the one that makes you high. And then there's CBD, um, which is uh, anti-inflammatory and is used for things like seizure disorders. And so CBD is often used in adolescents for, for seizure disorders and maybe some other things. But uh, back in the day when I was at CU, the gateway theory was, was pervasive. That is that when you start using cannabis, it leads to heavier drug use. That has since been disproven. Uh, so I worked for, uh, I was there for, I think, about eight years. And so I had uh, a lot of experience working with uh, doing survey stu type studies and also genetic type studies, um, looking at cannabis in that population. Had a hiatus for a while. And after my accident in 2009, um, I was in severe chronic pain. And my husband 
Uh, at that time, uh, cannabis was legal medically in Colorado. I had a, a qualifying condition. I had neuropathic pain, uh, but I was just mortified to ask anybody about cannabis because attitudes have changed dramatically over the years. In, in 2009, 2010, 2011, when I was going through a lot of um, trying to figure out what was going on and you know, trying to understand where the pain was coming from and all, all of the things that you go through when you're trying to get a diagnosis, um, the opioid crisis was at its highest and opioid prescriptions were just given out like candy. And that's what people wanted to put me on. Um, and I was looking for alternatives, but it just never occurred to me that cannabis actually was medicinal. Um, my coming from a professional athlete background at the time I was racing, it was banned completely, um, all components of it. Nowadays, um, cannabis is um, not is is banned, but in a different way. So CBD is allowed; it's not tested for; it's it's universally allowed. Um, THC is what they call a threshold drug, so you're allowed to. It's not allowed to be used in competition, um, and in competition is like 24 hours, I think, before your race and during the race. So you're not allowed to use it during that time period. But if you get drug tested. Um, you're allowed to have THC in your system up to a certain level. And if you go above that level, then that's a, a drug positive. It's, if it's below that level, then you're okay. The problem is nobody knows how much THC you need to reach that level and when you need to stop taking it before you reach that level. So there are a lot of unanswered questions that I would love to delve into um, at some point, but uh, that's for another day. Um, so given my background of working at CU where it was seen as this very nefarious drug and then being a professional athlete, I had a very negative um, stigma toward cannabis, um, but desperate to, oh, it became legal recreationally here in 2014. So it took away a barrier. I did not have to get a medical card. Didn't have to talk to any doctors. I was just ashamed to be honest, you know, to ask my doctors. I just didn't know what to do and was really ashamed about it. But when it became legal recreationally, it took away that barrier of having to get that doctor permission. I could just walk into a, dis a dispensary and get what I needed. So that's what I did. Marched into the dispensary and I'm like, these are my problems. I can't sleep because I have pain. I have spasms because of neuropathy. Um, you know, this is what I, you know, what do you recommend? So they gave me a bunch of stuff. This is, you know, try this patch, try this gummy, try this. And uh, I used the patch. Nobody told me I needed to cut that into pieces. Um, I got very high. Um, I don't enjoy being high. And I was very, 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 very high. Um, but I slept. And um, because I am a researcher, I was able to overlook the fact that I was too high. That's a dosing issue, easily rectified. And I, and I really honed in on the sleep issue, which was I slept, which was my goal. Mm -hmm. So over the years, I have um, you know modified my regimen. But I really was shocked at the medicinal aspect of it. And I went to the literature to see what was out there and found that most of the studies were looking at the negative aspects of cannabis. And there weren't a lot of studies looking at it more agnostically. Um, you know, it's not going to solve all problems. It's not all good. It's not all bad. It's somewhere in between. And as an epidemiologist, I decided that I wanted to study it in that manner, looking at it in a very neutral way. What are the benefits? What are the harms? Who is it going to help? Who is it going to hurt? What is it good for? What is it not good for? And so I started um, a nonprofit, Canada Research Foundation. We're very small but mighty. And our goal is to do um, high-level research so that we can help unlock the mysteries of cannabis and share that information with anybody who needs it, whether it's physicians, patients, um, stakeholders, uh, manufacturers, um, just get that information out there. So our, our goals are kind of two pronged. One is to do the research and the other is to disseminate the information. Wow, that's a, a lot to unpack, uh, first of all. So thank you for, for all of that. Now, how do you get your funding, by the way, before we go any further uh, for Canada Research Foundation? Our funding comes through uh, many different ways. Uh, right now, for example, we're writing a grant uh, to the National Institute of Drug Abuse to look at um, cannabis and its impact on mental health disorders. 
Um, we've received funding from patient advocacy groups. We've received funding from physician societies. Um, because we're a nonprofit, we also take donations from um, individuals or organizations that see what we do as important. Um, so we're always scrounging for money. Uh, you know, it's just very interesting to me that everybody is standing on the rooftops yelling for more research, but nobody wants to actually put the money in to fund the research. So it's this crazy conundrum. And then if you look at it, um, you know, the way cannabis is right now, it's a schedule one drug, it's federally illegal. So it's very difficult, especially for universities to do clinical trials and other kinds of studies where they would actually give people cannabis um, because they could lose their federal funding. So universities have gotten creative about how they get around that. Um, so it's legal on the state level in many states, whether it's medical or recreational or both. Um, so every state has their own rules and regulations. Um, but federally, they keep saying, well, we need more research. We need more answers as to what it can do, but you can't really do the research. So you're sort of backed into a corner in this negative feedback loop of, well, we want to do the research, but you can't do the research and then we can't get it federally legalized. And so around we go. Yeah. And I'd imagine like many nonprofits, uh, funding is the number one challenge that people have in order to continue to achieve your mission. Exactly. And we, you know, we try to collaborate with other entities. Uh, I strongly believe in collaborations and always have since graduate school, uh, because I think that the more input you can get from knowledgeable people, the better research that you can do. Whereas I think some researchers tend to um, really uh, want to, they're, they're afraid to share information because they, they want to be the one that puts that out there first. Whereas I think that collaborations are fantastic, more minds, more ideas, more things get done. So through these collaborations, we've been able to uh, work with some very top scientists and researchers and clinicians. So I wanna back up and ask a couple of basic questions. Now you mentioned that marijuana and cannabis are one and the same, correct? Yes. You mentioned that THC and CBD are the two byproducts of cannabis, is that correct? So um, if you look at cannabis, that's sort of like the umbrella, that's the, the, the genus, that's the plant. And so, 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 to clarify, so we're talking about the cannabis plant. The cannabis plant. Right. And then underneath that, you have hemp, which is legal, that was legalized in 2018 with the farm bill. And hemp is um, the cannabis plant that has less than 0.3% THC. So it's primarily CBD. And as I mentioned earlier, th those are cannabinoids. Those are molecules that are in the plant. And then um, we still do use the word marijuana and that more um, applies to um, plant, the cannabis plant that has higher levels of THC than hemp. Um, okay, so that's a good so, distinction. So same plant. Same plant, just different, different levels of THC. Different levels of THC. And, and are those at this point, um, I, I don't know if saying genetically modified is the right way to do it, but when people are growing the plant, um, they're growing plants with higher levels of THC versus growing a hemp plant with lower doses of THC. Is that accurate? Um, they, yes, they, they do kind of genetically modify um, for higher levels of THC. I mean, the levels of THC in um, the, the plant now are way higher than they were 10, 20 years ago. I mean, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, maybe it was 10% THC. Now we're seeing 20 to 26% THC or sometimes even higher. And um, CBD is all the rage now. It's in, you find it in everything and, you know, people tout it for, you know, anything that you can imagine. Um, they make um, unsubstantiated claims uh, there's a slide that I have when I give talks uh, about, uh, on it, it says that it can help your asthma. Well, CB CBD is not going to help your asthma and it shouldn't, I mean, you know, the FDA does send out letters to, um, manufacturers that make unfounded claims, but they can't reach everybody. And so, you know, you, you see a lot of websites that are advertising their products for things that are unsubstantiated. But let's even take a step back further. 
Okay. And let's talk about something called the endocannabinoid system. Yes, and, please, yes. you know, the question is, you know, the, the, the question being is, well, why does, why does cannabis even work in humans? And it's because we have built into our body something called the endocannabinoid system. And so we have receptors in our brain, in our periphery, um, uh, cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. And then we also have molecules that we make that bind to these receptors. And those are called endogenous, meaning that we make them ourselves. And so when we use cannabis, um, THC binds to these receptors that we have naturally in our bodies. And so if you have dysregulation of your endocannabinoid system, the, the thought is that when you use exogenous, meaning coming from outside your body, taking um, cannabis either in any of its forms, whether you smoke it, vape it, uh, use it as a topical, as a edible, as an oil, in some way that brings that dysregulation back into harmony in some way. Hmm. And because of where these receptors are in the body, um, for example, C the CB2 receptor is mostly in the gut, whereas the CB1 receptor is mostly in the brain. THC binds that CB1 receptor, which is why it has a psychoactive um, effects. But the cannabis plant itself we talk a lot about C THC and CBD, there are over a hundred um, cannabinoids. And so they are starting to um, look at other cannabinoids like CBG and CBN and, and what they do. And then they're now starting to modify them and get Delta-8 THC to try and get around some of these rules um, about Delta-9 THC, which is the one that's federally illegal. And I was just reading about another um, synthetically modified cannabinoid today that they don't know what to do. They just don't know how to regulate these, you know, cannabinoids that are now being, you know, modified synthetically. Uh -huh. um, but the plant is very complex. Yeah, when you say modified synthetically, we're not talking about in a laboratory necessarily. We're yes. Talking, so we are. So we're talking yes. about CBD or THC coming off the plant and then synthetically modified in a laboratory to then make it CBN or CBG or- No, so CBN, CBG and all that is already part of the plant but okay. they're modifying them in other ways to get other molecules that are not part of the plant itself Got it. um, or modifying yeah. them in ways to try to make them more stable because um, some, some of the cannabinoids aren't very stable and, but they could be very helpful medically. So they're trying to find ways to make them better, so to speak. So you brought up uh, these other CBNs and CBGs. Uh, what are the differences with those compared to CBD then? Um, so we're still, people are still trying to, I mean, it's a different, um, it's a different molecule, but okay. it's still like CBN, um, is used medically. Um, I actually use CBN. It helps with sleep, um, and, and other things. Um, but the THC and CBD are the two cannabinoids that are most well studied. The, these other ones, which people refer to as minor cannabinoids, um, are not as well studied because there are already so many barriers to studying the ones that are more abundant in the plant, that it's um, harder to study the ones that are less abundant in the plant. And then there's also terpenes, which give it the smell. So all plants have terpenes in it. And mm -hmm. there's also thought that the terpenes contribute to the medicinal um, efficacy of cannabis. And so there's something called the entourage theory. And that is that the whole plant, rather than taking out, you know, just bits and pieces is uh, better than, you know, like, so CBD alone may not be as efficacious as the whole plant or THC combined with THC, uh, CBD combined with THC may be better than either one of them by itself. Interesting. So I think what I'm hearing you say is products that are sold at, you know, at a supermarket or CVS or Walgreens or something like that as a CBD product that do not have any THC because they can't be sold that way, right? right. Um, may not be or have as much efficacy as something sold in a dispensary as a CBD product that might contain some THC. Is that what you're saying? Well, yes and no. So you brought up a very good point about um, CBD being sold everywhere from you know the Seems gas station way, to the online. I mean, CBD is all over the place. 
And numerous studies have shown that when you just go and buy CBD off the shelf at any of these various places that sell it, mm -hmm. um, most of them do not have what's on the label. So maybe they don't have CBD at all. Maybe it's got something else in it that's not on the label, like melatonin or some other product. Um, maybe it's got higher levels of THC than what CBD is supposed to have. So you're buying something that you think is CBD only, but it actually has levels of THC in it, which could be problematic for people who don't want THC or who are allergic to it or are being drug tested. Um, so if you're buying CBD only, I always tell people because it's not regulated in the same way that THC is that buy it from a reputable source and a reputable source means that you go online to that company's website and you look at them and see, are they making unfounded um, claims about their product? Do they have a certificate of analysis, which means that they have um, had it um, analyzed so that what's on the label is actually what's in the product. And Consumer Labs um, does studies every year to find out what the best products are. And so I recommend people kind of go online if they're using CBD uh, to see which are the more reputable products that are transparent and um, conti you know, continually are showing up on Consumer Labs kind of good list and not on their naughty list. Sure. Um, whereas so THC is regulated by the states and it can only be sold in a dispensary and you have to be um, of a certain age to get it. And um, those are tested in, like in Colorado, for example, anything that's sold in a dispensary has to be tested at a state regulated lab for numerous things, for potency, for molds, pesticides, a whole variety of things. If it's inedible, it has to be homogeneity so that, you know, if you buy a um, packet of gummies, you want to know that every single gummy has the same amount of THC in it that's on the label. So when you buy from a dispensary, it comes with a certificate of analysis and it says on it what's in it. Interesting. So what I think I heard you say is CBD by itself there's nobody regulating the production per se, like an FDA uh, of what's in CBD or what's listed on the container? Uh, that's correct. So um, there's, it's not regulated well at all there. And for both TH, for any cannabis product, um, the labeling is terrible and there, there isn't any consistent labeling across the board. So like if you were to go to any pharmacy and buy ibuprofen or any non-steroidal, Tylenol or Olive, um, the labels are all the same. Like there's very specific things that have to go on the label. That yeah. is not true for cannabis. Yeah. And sometimes the labels are very difficult to read. You can't even read the label because the print is so small. Mm -hmm. So it becomes, in in dosing is, is difficult as well because if you go, let's go back to the ibuprofen example. Um, if you buy that over the counter, um, one tablet, whether it's generic or, you know, not generic, 200 milligrams is the dose for one tablet for cannabis. There is just no specific dosing, um, you know, so, um, companies might say, you know, this is a dose, but there isn't nothing across the board that, um, you know, that's specific for dosing. Hmm. Wow. So that goes for both CBD products and THC products, right. including products that you're buying from a dispensary. Is what you're right. Saying. So, um, so the, the, company, right itself, the company itself might put on there that, you know, X number of milligrams is a dose, but um, it varies from company to company. And if you're using inhalation methods, um, you don't, you have no idea what dose you're, you have no idea how many milligrams you're getting because everybody's going to inhale differently. Um, that may change in the future, especially with vaping, because dose meter devices are coming out so that you can um, dial in better how many milligrams of THC you're getting um, through through vaping. Uh, fascinating. So I can't imagine that, you know, CBD or THC as, as any medication or drug is, is, you know, a blanket statement from anyone uh, could say that it's good or bad. But in your experience and in your research, who would you say are good candidates to potentially explore the use of CBD or THC? And maybe who shouldn't, by the way, as well? 
Um, well, I think that uh, in terms of THC, um, you know, young adults, you know, anybody whose brain is still developing should not be using THC unless they have a real, you know, medical reason where other things just aren't working and they have talked to their doctor about it and, you know, they're using it under very careful supervision. Um, so that that's a group that should not be using it. Um, when you say young adults. I think 25 and under, is that what you're thinking or? I mean, I'm kind of thinking 25 and under, but it's legal at 21. So you're probably, so, you know, people who are not of legal age should not be using it. Fair enough. Um, CBD is different. I mean, there is um, FDA approved drug called Epidiolex that is um, CBD that's approved for children with certain, a very specific seizure disorder. So, um, that that's being used, but again, any anybody who's under the age of twenty one should be consulting with with a professional before they embark on a cannabis journey. Um, other people that might be at risk from using cannabis are people that have um, a diagnosis of um, psychosis or have a first degree relative with a diagnosis of psychosis because THC can cause psychotic breaks. In people, so if you already have the propensity for it, um, you might not want to mess around with that. Um, people are also allergic to cannabis, so if you're allergic to it, um, it might also be something that you might not want to use. If you have asthma, um, you might want to think about your route of administration. Inhalation methods might not be the best. Um, in terms of people who should use it, um, you know, people who want to try it should try it. If they don't fit into those groups of people who shouldn't. Uh, the mantra in the world of cannabis is start low, go slow. Mm. So, you know, you always want to start at the a, a very low dose. So if you're using, let's say THC, two and a half milligrams would be considered a low dose. Um, CBD, on the other hand, um, is not very bioavailable, meaning that um, whatever you take in, a lot of it's not absorbed. And so most people are not taking therapeutic doses of CBD. You know, if they're taking five or 10 milligrams of CBD, it's probably not going to do that much. Um, so higher doses are, you know, in the in clinical trials, they're using much higher doses. But again, people are going to, everybody is so different and people respond differently. Like I don't respond well to CBD. It just doesn't do anything for me. Whereas I respond well to CBD with THC or THC by itself. And so people need to, um, if they're going to try cannabis, um, number one, they should speak with um, a cannabis professional, a doctor who know, is knowledgeable or a nurse who's knowledgeable about cannabis to ensure that it doesn't interact with any of the drugs that they're taking. And then to get some baseline guidance of um, where they should start for whatever it is that they're using it for. So, you know, I always tell people, why are you using it? Well, I just want to feel better. Well, feel better from what? What does feel better mean? That's just very nebulous. You know, is it that you can't sleep? Is it that you have anxiety? Do you have pain? Do you have depression? Um, there are so many reasons that people are using it that you sort of need to figure out why are you specifically using it? And then you can kind of figure out what you need based on that. And with that being said, talk to me a little bit about the dispensaries. When you walk into a dispensary and there's uh, somebody in their 20s or 30s behind the counter that seems to not necessarily have a medical degree, are, are these the types of individuals that you think are providing great recommendations and, and great advice to folks coming in who don't know what they're looking for? Uh, or should they be talking to an actual physician in, instead? Should talk to a physician first, uh, just to make sure that there are no drug interactions and um, people should be open about their cannabis use with their with their um, physicians or any of the providers they see, nurse practitioner, whomever they see, um, because it does change some things. For example, if you're having surgery and you're a cannabis user, you may need more anesthesia than a non-cannabis user. Um, so I do still recommend um, talking to a medical professional um, bud tenders, those are the people that work behind the counter, have very varying degrees of knowledge about cannabis. Um, I've spoken, I have a medical, uh, way back when I was, you know, 
very anti-medical card because, you know, the stigma that has long gone. I now have a medical card and some of the bud tenders I've spoken to are very knowledgeable and some have really not very much knowledge. So it really is variable. And um, you asked about groups that shouldn't be using cannabis. One is pregnant women. Um, mm -hmm. They've done a lot of studies showing that cannabis is not good for pregnant women to use, yet many bud tenders do recommend it for women who are coming in because they've got nausea and other kinds of issues that they're dealing with. And so right, right there is a, a perfect example of the disconnect about what's in the literature and what studies are showing and what's being recommended by people behind the counter. And I'm not saying that all bud tenders are recommending it to pregnant women, but many are. And so that's why it's good to talk to a medical professional or do some homework yourself. Yeah. And, and so with those two things, number one, talking to your profession, your medical provider or professional, being that it is not legal at the federal level, um, if somebody does tell their physician and does go into their permanent file or record, right, medical records, could there be consequences or recourse as it relates to Medicare or Medicaid, you know? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, I, I do know that um, older adults are the fastest growing um, initiators of cannabis use. Um, there's multiple studies coming out uh, about um, use in older adults. Older adults have a lot of pain, uh, anxiety, uh, uh, you know, a myriad of issues, and they're turning to cannabis because a lot of older adults are on lots of medications and perhaps they want to do away with them or they just aren't working as well as they'd like and cannabis might just be a good adjunct to what they're using. Um, for myself, ex as an example, um, uh, I have severe pain and I thought that cannabis was going to be the panacea and I'd never have to take another pain pill again in my life. And um, that is not the case, but um, I don't need nearly as much pain medicine as um, other people suffering the same things that I am. I believe because cannabis number one can enhance uh, the efficacy of an opioid, it makes it last longer. And number two, it, it is a pain reliever. And so um, because I do, I microdose it throughout the day, meaning I take small bits of it and I um, combine CBD with THC, so when you put the two together, um, because they're sort of fighting for the same receptor, CBD takes down that high that you get from THC. So if you use that in combination, you get the benefit of the anti-inflammatory effects of CBD, but you also get the benefits of the THC. But when you put them together, you also, if you find that right ratio that works for you and everybody's different, um, you can be functional and not you know, high, which when you're working, you certainly don't wanna be high. Sure, sure. It's interesting you bring up older adults because most of my clients happen to be older adults. And uh, that was part of my interest in, in having this conversation with you today. So that's fascinating to hear that they're the, I don't know the right terminology or the terminology used, but fastest adopters uh, of cannabis today. It's yes, and they are. And what uh, we did a study um, several years ago looking at athletes, and we had a very big age range. And it was very interesting that most uh, most of the older adults were using CBD, sort mm -hmm. of, I guess, dipping their toe in, sure. and uh, you know, just uh, you know, let's try some CBD, see how that goes, and then you know, often then moving over to THC. Uh, but it it uh, is a, it's a powerful plant and can do a lot of things. But uh, for older adults who are using uh, cannabis, um, THC can um, affect your balance, it can affect your thought process. And so that's a group for whom it's very important to get the dosing right so that you don't fall or have impairment that you don't want. And that's why talking to the medical professional, start low, go slow, and you know really dial it in in a manner that's right for you so that you don't uh, encounter issues that you don't want. You don't want to have the added adverse effects. Yeah. When you say affecting your balance and things of that nature, I imagine not positively, um, more negatively in, in the sense that if you are uh, using cannabis, it could negatively impact your balance. Right? Exactly. It can negatively impact your balance. And so, which, which I, I might as well add that it's obviously illegal, I believe, to drive a motor vehicle or operate a motor vehicle while on 
THC. Is that accurate? That is, that is accurate. And there are multiple studies that are ongoing trying to figure out how to do roadside testing for um, cannabis um, such that they have for alcohol. And it's very difficult to do so. Um, so that's something that they're trying to find, figure out is how to determine who's driving high. Right. And, and regardless of the fact that they haven't figured it out yet, it's still illegal. Uh, but CBD is not because it doesn't have an impact um, ultimately uh, in a brain in the same way. It doesn't have the psychoactive effects psychoactive, and the same right. kind of impairment that THC will give you. Got it. So you can consume CBD while operating vehicle, but not THC. Correct. So, um, all very fascinating. You mentioned uh, earlier as well uh, a couple of things I want to circle back on. I can't remember all of them, but one of them that I think struck me um, as well was the uh, the fact that we have our own endocannabinoid system. Is that the right term? Yep, endocannabinoid the endocannabinoid system. Yep. System. Not an easy word for me to say, by the way. It's um, a it's, it's a big it's a big word. It just rolls off your tongue, and and yet this cannabinoid cannabinoid system does it attach to our own system or does it work in conjunction with our system? I mean, so it enhances our system. I'm trying to understand that a little bit more. So, um, so the endocannabinoid system, uh, we have these receptors and okay. then we, we make molecules that bind to these receptors, okay. we na naturally make them. And, um, when we take cannabis, it binds to those same receptors that the molecules that we make bind to. Gotcha. Okay. Very fascinating. So where do we go from here? You know, where's, where's the research going from here with cannabis and or other plant-based medicine. I can't imagine that you guys are dealing with other plant-based medicine, but I do hear about whether it's psychedelic mushrooms or medicinal use. Um, is that in your realm? Is that in your future or are you 100% cannabis focused? At this point? No, I'm actually, uh, I also work uh, with a clinical trial group and um, our kind of niche is plant-based medicine. So uh, we're hopefully going to be doing a THC tri a clinical trial uh, in the near future. And we're also very interested in psilocybin and other natural medicines that can be helpful for people for a variety of maladies. Fascinating. If people want to get more information, I'll put a link down below, but where would you recommend that they get more information? Um, uh Leafly has good information. Leafly? Uh, Leafly is a website that has good information. Um, Kenigma has good information. And, um, you know, Google Scholar, if people want to really delve into it deeply and look at research articles, um, even just uh, looking at the abstract or reading the results um, can be very helpful. Um, you know, I just uh, looking online at reputable uh, rep reputable publications and sources. That's a hard one. Reputable publications and sources. I know in my industry, at least that's, uh, it's very hard to distinguish which ones are reputable or not. I can imagine in your industry, the same. It is, it's, I think for everything it's, you know, there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation out there. Um, which is why I always think it's good to go straight to the literature, but mm -hmm. if people don't want to do that, those are two good, um, sites that people can look at. And, um, you know, just talking to professionals and other people um, also can be a great way to gain information and education. And if people want to support your organization and Cannabis Research Foundation, I'll include a link below as well for people to support and donate if they'd like. Uh, but do you have research and findings on your website as well? Um, we do have some research finding on our website. Uh, I'm hoping at some point to put together some educational materials uh, on the website uh, so that, you know, people have a place to go to get what they want, or at least putting links to other sites that have uh, good information. So it's a, a work in progress. Fantastic. It always is. But Joanna, thank you for your time, your knowledge, and uh, and sharing with everyone today. Is there anything else that, that we missed that you'd like to just share before we sign off today? I don't think so. I don't know if people write in questions to you or not, but if you get, uh, if people want to write in some questions and uh, there are things that we didn't cover that people seem very interested in, uh, happy to come back and talk about those things. 
Fantastic. Well, I can provide again your contact information or your website if people want to reach out to you directly, if that'd be okay. Sure thing. All right, John. Thank you again for your time. This was fabulous. Look forward to doing it again. You need to.